that God gave a gift that just keeps on giving. And there was no gift any better than what he gave us. You know, it was a perfect gift. Okay? As we're reading in the book of James, our continued study here, starting at chapter and ber- chapter 1, verse 20, uh, as we read out the different things that James addressed in his letter here, we find out that today the church and we as people at the uh, congregation are guilty of the same issues that they were back then, having the same problems. And you know, and as I keep studying and digging, I find out myself that I am guilty of some of these things also. You kind of get, uh, you look back on yourself and all, and it's one, just so glad that uh, God forgives and that we have the mediator between us and him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to defend us. So, uh, so as we start today in verse 20, James chapter 1, he says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And uh, give some thoughts on that. Isaiah really said it really about as good as anybody could have, I reckon, could have wrote it. And it's in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. A lot of times when we find out God's ways has more than one purpose. In other words, you know, uh, for example, if somebody comes to you and they're in need and you have it, you say, sure, I give it. I will give you what you need. Well, the person that received it, they got a blessing, didn't they? They got a gift, they got a blessing. But yet God blessed you to begin with for you to have it. So you see, there you are. More, two people get a blessing from one act. And that's what is God's ways higher than ours, is that we don't fully understand a lot of times until later until you start getting the full measure of God's blessings is how his decisions is how it affects many people other than just one. Okay, in 21, James, James, he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive the meekness of the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. The engrafted word. The engrafted word is right here. That which is inputted into your heart and in your mind, the Word of God that brought you under the knowledge and knowing that you are a sinner, you're lost, and that your destination is not where you want to be. So, and it also tells you that uh, through Jesus Christ, there's salvation. And as you sit and hear these words, and your mind starts putting it together, when God calls you on you to come, this is where you need to be. And you, and you come to that knowledge, you know, that the Holy Spirit is working on you, and he, you come to that knowledge, you know, it is revealed to you. So that engrafted word is the word of God. And that's what we can stand on today. And that's what he's saying here. He said that can save your soul. You know, this body was built to house and maintain your soul. That God put that soul in it, but this housing that he formed out of the dirt and the dust and breathed life into it was to maintain and support your soul. Now, once God wants to recall that soul from the walks of life, then this body is no longer needed. It's going to go back to the soil, just back, back where it's come from. 
And a lot of people say, well, I don't understand why you say it goes back to dirt. Well, everything that you put in your mouth to eat, one way or another, comes from the ground, right? Think about it. And direct or indirect, it comes from the ground. So there you are. Okay, so the engrafted word, okay, put in your mind. St. John 15, 2 and 3 says this. Every branch in me that beareth forth fruit, and beareth forth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that bringeth forth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now this is Jesus talking. You are clean through the word that he has spoken. Jesus spoke the word that leads you to salvation and told his church, taught his disciples this. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27 says this, that he might sanctify and clean it with the washing of the water by the word, that he may present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. He's talking about the church. He's talking about me and you. That's my and your daily job or daily uh, occupation should be is to try to keep ourselves as holy as possible so when we come together as this church, as this group, that we can send up praises to him for what he's done for us that it is by his word that he has acknowledged, give us that knowledge of what we need to do on in our daily lives, not just on a Sunday, just the fact that you'll get up on Sunday morning and come to church and be a good boy or a good girl. It's a seven-day-a-week job, you know. So this is what the word of God it, it tells us, you know, and and Jesus tried to, you know, preach. It's, it's what we do every day. This is the example that people see. Your daily life, your activity, the way you talk, the things that you do. People are watching. If you're going to have a witness to someone that's lost, you're going to have to be that witness. Live that witness. You can't just say it. You've got to be able to show it in your life, in your works, right? Okay. Okay, so we'll go to James chapter, uh, verse 22. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Doers, that's what I was just trying to say. Don't just hear the word and let it die. you got to do it every day. You've got to be there every day. And uh, to live that life that other pe people will draw other people. You know, and that's, sometimes that's kind of hard because, <coughs> you know, we're human, or I am, and I make mistakes. And uh, boys, I'll tell you, sometimes it'll come back to bite you. And I hate to, when it does, it just gets all over me. I I, I've got to get down and talk to the Lord about it. Just did. Yeah. Okay. In the and twenty two, twenty three says, for if any if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man that beholds his natural face in a glass, for he doth he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forget us what manner of man he was. That's what we're saying, ain't it? We forget who we are if we don't be a doer of the word and not just to hear. One, it's one has got reacts with the other. You know, to be a Christian person, if you say that I'm a Christian or I've been saved, then you can't just say it. You've got to live it. Amen. Every day, you've got to live it. In Galatians 6 and 2 and 3, Apostle Paul wrote this. 
It said, Bear ye one another's burden, so fulfilling the law of Christ. For if a man thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Amen. You know, and that's true. We really do. <clears throat> and bearing each other's burdens, when somebody is down and out, and they're in need, somebody's sick, uh, you know, in our day and time, right to today, we've got so many things to pray about and so many people to pray for. We could almost uh, make an occupation, really. Amen. It is. I mean, it's just that many. If we do it right, uh, <clears throat> so much sickness and everything going on. But to be, uh, to bear one another's burdens, to talk to the Lord, you know, pray about it, to pray for them, and uphold them in front of the Lord, that's the... Uh, and we talk about, see, in so in 25, he says this, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. God blesses those that does the work that they're asked to do right. You know that, how he blesses people for doing right? It's the law of liberty. <coughs> Freedom from oppression, slavery, bondage, imprisonment. And you know, Jesus characterizes his mission here on earth by, by quoting what Isaiah wrote and uh, to, to, uh, to explain this to you I'd like for all of you to turn to Luke chapter 4 you know many times I've, I have read through this and everything but uh, it never really sinks in until you have a, a point to where you're looking to explain something that you you want to explain out, you've got to look to see how, like James, come to this de decision, you know. So in Luke chapter 4, we'll start at verse 16, and he says this, talking about Jesus here, that, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as the custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Since the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to reco and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So Jesus characterized his, his journey to, down here to do these things, what he came to do, the will of God, and that Isaiah really hit the nail on the head. You know, you, I can't believe that Isaiah came to this on his own thought. Can you? I think that the Lord endowed him with this the spirit. It was upon him, endowed him with this, and so with a lot of these uh, the prophets, that they were so close to God, they were, <coughs> they prayed, they were, you know, the man of God at that time, a prophet, but that God revealed things to them, to the people. And we're talking about 
looking into the future. You know, today, I can't even think of what's happen, going to happen an hour from now. Can you? Other than Brother Jimmy getting up here preaching. I mean, you know, that, but, you know, beyond that, I don't know what happened. But these people, the God touched their heart you know, and revealed things to them. <laughs> and with Christ acknowledging what he did here in Luke, what Luke wrote, you know, that's... Sometimes it's really... Sometimes it's really hard to comprehend all this, but there's one thing about it. Jesus fulfilled the Word of God when he came. What wrote, did he? In Romans chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, Paul wrote this. <clears throat> said, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles. For there is no respect of person with God. And then in Hebrews he wrote, 6, 9, and 10, he says, But beloved, we are persuaded that better things to you, of you, and things that accompany salvation, though, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. <laughs> so that's what, when come back here said that God bless his people, when James, when James said that God bless his people, <clears throat> the other prophets, like Paul, acknowledge the same thing. God doesn't forget what you do for him. There's so many days in your life you are going to live so far, so long, to that day of your departure. When you take part of your life's time and you spend it to uplift the Word of God or uplift the Lord or praise God or whatever, God doesn't forget this. You're giving back to Him what He gave to you. you know, and you're going to get a blessing. He's going to bless you for that. You know? And... Uh, that's like coming, your time coming here in church. If you sing songs, you praise the Lord, you pray, you praise Him. God don't forget this. If you, yeah, and if you do things for other people and don't expect nothing for it, God, God don't forget these things for us. Just like He doesn't forget the sins you're committing either. He has those wrote down, yes. He. So, anyway, He is a just God. A God of judgment. Okay, in 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and brideth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Wow. See, you know, remembering that James wrote, I told you that what... James, the things that James is covering says resting in an empty faith which does not influence life if your religion or the faith that you think you have is not changing your life in at all you're still living the way you was before you think you got it then it's, you have a vain religion and Webster says that vain means having no real value or significance, worthless. So why do it if it's worthless, if it's not going to mean anything to you? you know, if there's got to be that change. If you get saved, the Holy Spirit enters into you, the, ch the change is inevitable. It's, it takes place. Amen. And other people can see it. Amen. You know, and I have... Be in the church here, see people that's been saved, get up off of their knees right here. The look in their face is totally different than when they than it was before. I'm not talking about I'm talking about days before when they'd come to church. Whenever they got up off of that there and turned around and looked, there was a whole different glow in their face. 
Amen. You can tell when the Spirit of God enters. In uh, 27, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions and to keep them, keep himself unspotted from the world. In Mark 12, first starting at verse 28, if you want to turn there, I'll wait a minute. Mark 12, 28. Mark writes this. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, talking about Jesus, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, ye old Israel, the Lord our God is one, is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. So this is the first commandment. And the second one is like this, is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. To keep ourselves unspotted from the world. These are the things that we've got to do. Amen. If we do this, then we will not want to confide. We will not want to mingle ourselves again with the world. Paul says in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 6, he says this, I exhort thee therefore that first of all, supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. You know, and that's, uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, in John 3:16. What he said there, Paul just says in the, saying the same thing here, that all men should be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And the truth is the Word of God. This is the, whole, this is the truth that we can rely on from day to day, year to year, and throughout our lives. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all and see, to be tested in due time. And boys, I'll tell you, testified in due time. And boy, we have really put that in the works, haven't we? In the world today, uh, people, it seems to leave him out. But when we but when we realize in our lives that we have him here, we feel different. When we hear other people talk, we feel different than they do. We don't want to do the things that they do. Amen. That is the testimony of what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Amen. God. So, anyway, that's the end of chapter 1. We'll pick up chapter 2 next week, starting. And... Uh, so, Brother Doug, would you like to end our uh, closer class to form us a prayer?